Hi, my name is Angela Sanford and I'm an Associate Professor of Internal Medicine in the Division of Geriatrics. I work at St. Louis University School of Medicine and today we are going to be talking about dementia assessment. My disclosure is that part of my salary is supported by the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program grant which is um, supported by um, HRSA in the federal government. So just a little background on dementia before we talk about assessment. There are many types of dementia. Um, in the U.S., Alzheimer's disease is thought to be the most prevalent or is diagnosed the most frequently, followed by vascular dementia. Um, contrast this with other areas of the world, we'll see a reversal in that, and that vascular dementia is um, more often diagnosed than Alzheimer's. But in the U.S., it's Alzheimer's disease that's most prevalent, followed by vascular dementia followed by Lewy body, um, which is on the Parkinson's disease spectrum as well, and that's followed by frontotemporal dementia. One of the common questions, most common questions I get in the clinic setting is um, patients asking me, what are the normal changes in memory with age and are there normal changes? Is this just because I'm getting older or am I noticing that I'm starting to lose my mind is what a lot of patients will say. Um, the answer is yes. There's a slower recall of information, particularly names. Um, you can also see this, another example of this is a patient will tell me that they often walk into a room and can't remember why they walked into that room. Um, and my question is, do you ever remember why? And if they say, yes, I do eventually retrieve why I came into the room, that is a normal um, change in, in memory with age. If they're unable to um, retrieve that information, that may be something more to look into. Um, there's an increased effort needed to learn new tasks. So an example of this would be, you know, giving a 90-year-old the newest version of an iPhone versus her 13-year-old um, great-grandson. Um, the 90-year-old often will find that it takes much longer um, of practicing uh, to learn the new functions of the iPhone, and the 13-year-old will master this, you know, in 30 minutes. Um, there is a greater difficulty multitasking with age as well. I often hear this from women. Um, you know, I'll hear a, a woman will tell me, I used to be able to cook dinner and balance the checkbook and talk on the phone all at the same time. And now I'm unable to do more than one task at a time um, without really messing it up. Um, this is normal. There's an easier distractibility and a slower processing speed in general. Um, I do remind everyone that dementia is not normal in the older adult. So if you're seeing changes outside of what um, is considered normal, um, we need to look into this further. So the goals for a diagnosis of dementia, um, at first, the first goal would be to re rule out reversible causes. We also want to be able to distinguish between the various types of dementia and be able to say what category this person's dementia falls into. And ultimately, we'd like to build a comprehensive treatment plan, um, look, taking into account biopsychosocial um, components really tailored to the individual and their family. So there is not one, um, one single test that we can do that will diagnose dementia or tell us what type of dementia. Um, rather, the diagnosis is based on a, a thorough assessment by an experienced clinician. It sometimes takes me several visits to become comfortable assigning a specific type of dementia because seeing the trajectory of the progression can help me assign a certain type um, because each type of dementia progresses a little bit differently. So in terms of the complete medical history, things that I'm looking for um, really are asking detailed questions about an individual's overall health, their current and past medical conditions. I also want to know detailed uh, medication list of their prescription and over-the-counter medications, you know, as medicines can affect memory. I also ask about their ability to perform their activities of daily living and how this has changed or hasn't changed over time. Um, and has there been any changes in behavior or personality? Next, I'll move on to a physical and neurological examination. And what I'm looking for here um, are, is if there's any evidence of any sort of movement disorder, such as Parkinson's disease, or is there weakness on one side to suggest a former stroke? Um, and with the neurological examination, 
oftentimes the memory tests will fall under this category. So we'll see in the upcoming slides, I, I prefer, prefer to use the St. Louis University Mental Status Examination, the SLUMS exam, or the Rapid Cognitive Screen, but there are other memory tests that are you know, widely available for use as well. Um, oftentimes the full comprehensive memory assessment includes imaging, so a CT or MRI of the head, and what we're looking for here is any kind of structural brain disease. So, you know, are the ventricles enlarged suggesting normal pressure hydrocephalus? Um, is there small vessel disease or, or, or um, evidence of prior strokes? So often if a patient has never had an imaging test, it's a good time to get one. Um, we do basic laboratory tests, and what I'm looking for here is ruling out any sort of electrolyte derangements. I usually look and make sure there's no evidence of diabetes. Um, we check thyroid studies to make sure there's not any untreated thyroid conditions, and also order a B12 level as this can you know, affect memory if it's in the abnormal range. A neuropsychological assessment is optional. This is a more in-depth uh, type of testing that usually takes several hours. Um, and I, I, will, I will do it in certain cases um, if I'm unable to come up with a diagnosis with our sim more simple testing methods. And again, at the present time, there's no single diagnostic test that we have for detecting mild cognitive impairment, um, dementia, or determining which type of dementia may be present. So our goal, our first goal is to rule out any reversible causes um, and to treat these. We have a mnemonic that we use, um, it's called dementias, and these list the, the reversible causes. So drugs, emotional uh, represented by depression, metabolic, so that's where you your thyroid and your B12 disorder falls into place, eyes and ears, so as someone um, with profound hearing impairment that may be um, affecting their ability uh, to understand what's happening around them. Uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus, that's the N. Um, T is tumor. I will say a lot of times patients are worried about a brain tumor, but I have not yet found um, a brain tumor during a routine um, memory assessment. Um, infection, so any kind of chronic infection or a history of syphilis. A is atrial fibrillation or alcoholism, so I, I do try to ask about alcohol use. Um, and atrial fibrillation can lead to vascular dementia by causing small strokes or large strokes. Um, the S is sleep apnea. Untreated sleep apnea definitely affects cognition, so we always ask questions around sleep. Um, we think the reversible causes represent around 10% of all dementias, so they are important to rule out. It's an easy thing to do, and that's what I usually start with in my dementia assessment. This is the St. Louis University Mental Status Examination. This is the memory test that I prefer to use. This is what I was trained to use. So it's out of 30 points. Um, and so we would go through the questions and determine how many um, points. And the, the good thing about the SLUMS exam is that it's adjusted for education level. Because um, it's probably not fair to compare someone who has a college degree with someone that didn't finish high school. Their uh, baseline education level might be different and they may not be um, as adept at taking tests. So this is ad adapted for that. It takes about five to seven minutes to administer, and I like to do the full slums. You'll see on the next slide is sort of the mini slums, but I like to do the full slums at that first assessment visit. And then you can track changes over time quite easily by doing it at subsequent visits. This is the rapid cognitive screener, RCS as we call it, and it's made up of questions from the slums exam. It's designed um, for practitioners who may not have as much time to do a full slums. Again, that takes about five to seven minutes, minutes, and this takes about three to five minutes to administer. So I find often the first visit I'll do the slums and then um, repeated visits, I'll do the rapid cognitive screen just to check in on things. Um, unless there's major concerns, then we'll do a full slums. Why is an early diagnosis of dementia imperative? It's really important because it can identify any potentially reversible or treatable causes, and these can be corrected before permanent damage to the brain is done. Um, also, it can facilitate planning for patients and families. 
So ideally, we'd want patients to be diagnosed earlier so that we can put things into place, such as you know having them name a POA for the event that their memory loss progresses. And maybe at some point they'll be unable to you know sign the financial paperwork or name um, legally a POA that they'd like to make their decision. So we'd like to make an earlier diagnosis so we can get these things in line. Um, getting finances in order or set up so that someone else can manage if the patient's unable to, and discuss medical preferences in the form of advanced directives or living wills. Um, an early diagnosis can also address critical safety issues such as driving and living alone before a crisis occurs. Um, I had a personal experience with this in my family. Um, my grandpa had dementia, was undiagnosed, but we all noticed you know, changes in his memory. This was before I was um, a doctor. Um, I was in college actually when grandpa came to live with us. Um, but why he came to live with us is because he was driving unsafely and we were unaware that it was unsafe and he was driving down a one-way road the wrong way. And the police spotted him and were behind him with their lights on and he never saw them he just kept driving um, and then they called in two additional patrol cars who were on the sides of him driving and he definitely ne he, he, he didn't see them for many minutes um, and then he finally reached his destination where they arrested him for evading you know for not pulling over evading the police um, and he was unaware the whole time so my mom had to go to the jail and um, get him out of jail, and his license was taken away. And so I always think of this situation that happened in my own family and think, what if someone would have diagnosed him earlier, a medical professional? My mom would have definitely taken the keys away had anyone ever suggested that, or had we known the severity of his memory impairment. Um, also, an early diagnosis can explain to families why the patient acts and thinks different and allow families to place the the blame on the disease process and not the patient themselves. So what are the implications for healthcare providers? Having a diagnosis of dementia may change our approach with the patient and should change our approach with the patient. You know, should caregivers be present or should we request that the son from the waiting room comes in um, to be updated during the visit? Should written and verbal instructions be provided? Is there a pattern maybe to repeat hospitalizations or ER visits that may indicate the patient isn't getting um, their needs met at home or get it having enough oversight? And then knowing that someone has a dementia, we can then turn our focus to the caregiver and ask, how are you doing? You know, how, how are you managing this care that you're providing? And then knowing that someone has dementia also may change the overall uh, big picture about their health management. You know, if their life expectancy is limited by this progressive course, maybe the mammogram is not something we need to consider right now. This is a safe return bracelet um, from the Alzheimer's Association. Um, when I diagnose dementia in its in advanced stages, I'll speak with the family about this. Um, it helps um, for those who have an elopement risk. And of course, every family, you know, no family thinks their loved one has an elopement risk. It just happens when it happens. But something to consider um, discussing to keep a, a patient safe. The patient's name is not on this bracelet. It, there's a, an ID number. And so if that patient is, or that person is found wandering outside, um, the person can call, uh, you know, who finds them can call the number on top and give the ID number. It protects the, the the person with dementia's identity. And the Alzheimer's Association actually will link that ID number to the emergency contact and call. And after I diagnose dementia, one of the questions I, I try to remember to ask is, are there guns in the house? I think we forget this a lot, but it's important to ask for safety reasons. And then once someone's diagnosed with dementia, as I said before, we can sort of um, turn our focus on the caregiver um, and, and also ask what kind of resources may you need that, to help you be successful. And also explore feelings regarding um, when placement outside of the home may be needed. You know, how will you know that you can no longer provide care for, for your loved one? And how can I help you with the next steps? 
When I do the initial dementia evaluation, I also ask about advanced directives in living wills and powers of attorney. This paperwork is very important to put into place as early as possible and to have those discussions about if this progresses, which most types of dementia do, you know, what are your wishes for end of life care? Having some of those will up early on, you know, the family having those documented will really help later down the road when they're having to make those difficult decisions. And that is all for our dementia assessment. Thank you very much.